Scroll and Dagger presents The Pensive Tower Episode 1 Inheritance Right, that seems to be working. Well, I suppose I should start at the beginning. My name is Paxton Ferox, and until recently, I worked as an underlibrarian here at the Pensive Tower. The tower was established around 500 years ago to serve as a repository for the people of the Five Seas Federation where they could donate the memories and experiences they felt needed to be remembered. This was done with the goal of ensuring that the event remembered today only as the Great Collapse, which occurred nearly 2,000 years ago, an event which led to the loss of the accumulated knowledge of the ancient world, could not happen again. I said until recently because the High Librarian, Adeptus Edebarus, has promoted me to the newly created position of Inscriber, and has transferred me, along with several others, to the new Nemigraphy department. I have worked as an underlibrarian for nearly a decade now, ever since my graduation, and have in that time worked in most sections of the Tower Library in one capacity or another. Most of what we receive is valuable to no one but the owner, treasured memories that they wish to preserve against age or infirmity, but sometimes we do get the odd recollection which is flagged as noteworthy and given special attention by the librarians. Such memories are in the minority, but it is these entries that Master Edebarus is particularly interested in transferring from the hard paper of the record books onto these new nimigraphs. I, for one, am not keen on the idea, the old record books serve just fine with a little tender attention and care, but the High Librarian insisted that those recollections deemed noteworthy will be inscribed onto these ridiculous spinning pyramids. I would complain, but the High Librarian is Dracarian and is therefore twice my size with the ability to quite literally breathe the flesh off my bones, so we shall persevere. Now, the Pensive Tower has been active for around five centuries, so even though there are comparatively few of these noteworthy cases, that still leaves thousands of memories spread across the entirety of the library that will need to be inscribed. I suppose when the job is finished it will free up a lot of much-needed space, but it is going to be a massive undertaking. Only today I have been brought several books, each containing hundreds of memories that span decades of history. Fortunately, it is a point of pride for the librarians that we have kept the tower well organised, and the memories selected for inscribing have been highlighted, so at least I won't have to scour the library myself. That being said, I understand the librarians are sending books to our department as soon as they find the noteworthy memories, so there may be some irregularity in terms of the memory dates. I have, I'm glad to say, been given the help of an assistant, a diamond girl by the name of Gilia. She'll be helping me with the various day-to-day -day tasks that go with this project, though she seems more interested in keeping the office tidy than anything else. The process for this inscribing will involve me reading the written memories aloud, along with any supplemental correspondences or follow-up that might be attached to the memories. The Venoscribe device will then capture and inlay my words into the nimigraph. These recordings may then be played back at will using the Nimi phone. This will apparently be a great help to those who visit the tower to relive the memories they or their loved ones have donated, because the chained goddess forbid that they partake in the arduous task of reading. <sighs> I'm aware that this has turned into a bit of a tirade. I should maybe discard this Nimigraph and start again, but the damned things are so prized by everyone around here that... Doing so would get more than the High Librarian breathing down my neck. I probably still have space for one of the shorter ones. Let me see here. Uh, yes, here we are. The memory of Felix Locken. Human. Aged 24, identified as male. 
Memory regards a curious sighting while exploring an underground cave network in the Yoskai Wilds, and was donated on the 17th of the month of Sun's Height in the year 721. Inscribed by Paxton Ferox on the 2nd of Thresher's Tyne, 729. We begin. I don't know how to make you believe that I saw what I'm telling you I saw. It's hard, I know. I wouldn't believe me. But all I can say is that it's true. I saw that thing down there and I need to tell someone. I can't tell it to my guildmates. They definitely wouldn't believe it. But this is what you're for, right? Folks can come in and tell their stories and you won't judge them. You can just write it all down and, I don't know, pass it along if you feel like it. Maybe you'll do nothing with this. Maybe you'll just think I'm mad. But at least I'll have told someone. So now, if I am right, then it'll be your fault for not telling anyone, not mine. I should start from the beginning, though, right? I'm a sellsword with the Red Steel Mercenary Guild. We operate mostly in El Alton City and the surrounding country. It's mainly muscle work, guarding caravans or rich folks, that sort of thing. Because of that, it was hard for me to get approved for membership. Red Steel tends to prefer Auckland's or Toroxen, you know, the big, tough folks. Humans don't normally get more than a second glance, but I was able to prove my worth and I got in. They mostly kept me on the grunt work, small stuff like collecting money owed to the guild, bit of treasure hunting or clearing out wild animals. Not really the warrior life I'd hoped for, but the money was decent, so I didn't complain too much. When this job came in, nobody thought much of it, just another rich brat who wanted a job doing that he didn't feel like doing himself. He said his name was Alexi Delane. Name meant nothing to me. He claimed he was descended from some guy called Duliono, an old war hero from back before unification. I'd never even heard of him, but to hear the boy prattle on about him, you'd think he'd won the War of Seventy Years single-handed or something. It was Aurum Salatar, Red Steel's leader, who actually took down the details. He handed them to me later when he gave me the job. You see, Alexei had been researching this De Leono, reading old history books and accounts written by people who knew him, and one of these books said that he'd had this sword which had his family crest displayed on the hilt. And, well, you guessed it, Alexei thought it would be the same as his family's, which would prove they were related. So he wanted us to reclaim the sword. I have no idea why anyone would care, but folks in that class play their own games, don't they? Besides, for the money he was offering, I wasn't about to argue. Now, the reason he couldn't get it himself was that it had been lost in the Yoskai Wilds. Apparently, this Duliono and his companions had been exploring a network of caves, and they had had a run-in with a pack of Kirox. Nasty way to go, that. Only one of the companions got away alive. So, Duliono died down there, and Alexei reckoned his sword should still be there. For my money, I thought the Kirox would have taken anything valuable with them when they left, and that sword was probably long gone. But Salatar, he says, okay, signs the contract, takes the boy's gold, and, obviously, I'm the one he picks to go with the little scrub out to this cave. I don't know if you've ever been to the Yoskai Wilds. It's not a bad part of the world, really. I'm sure if you're into weird trees and every shade of flying pest in the country, you'd probably love it there. I'm in there at least once a month. Lots of stuff lurking in the wilds, stuff that some want found and stuff that merchants want protecting from if they have to take their caravans in that direction. I loaded up on provisions, made sure my sword was sharp and that I had plenty of spare powder and shot for my pistols. I've not often had trouble in the wilds, but it's generally better to over-prepare than under. Next morning, we set off. It took us a couple of hours to reach the cave, and I swear to the witness that every step of the way that boy complained. About the humidity, the swamps, the tree roots, he was tired, he was hungry, we were going the wrong way. By the time we arrived at the cave, I was all too happy to be leaving that little runtling behind and going in alone. I lit one of the torches I'd brought with me and began my search. I've already said I didn't expect to find anything, and nothing I'd heard since leaving El Alton had changed my mind. 
but I figured since I was there anyway, I'd poke around, head as deep as I dared into the cave, and head back when I inevitably found nothing. The caves were long and wide and dark. I can't imagine what brought that Duliono in there, what him and his mates might have been after, but there was nothing in there now. Or so I thought. I'd gone in a fair way. One of my torches had burned out and I had lit the second. My plan was to wait until it started to burn down, then I'd turn around and head back. I'd been marking my path with chalk as I went, so I wasn't worried about finding my way out again. I'd just crossed a junction and I was marking my path when the torch blew out. Just like that. It was as if a sudden gust of wind had blown up from the cave's depths. I was plunged into blackness. Naturally, I started cursing a blue moon and began trying to find the third torch in my bag. Then, I don't know how to describe it. I was just suddenly aware I wasn't alone anymore. Hearing something behind me, I turned around, grabbing for my pistol. Then I saw it, and I froze. It was an eye. An enormous eye. It was bright yellow and it seemed to glow. The whole cave was illuminated by it like it was suddenly full of candlelight. It was so bright I couldn't even see the head behind it. All I could see was the eye. It had a long slit pupil, like a cat's. It was close enough that I could see myself reflected in that pupil like it was a full-length mirror. So I knew it had seen me. Then this translucent eyelid slid across it and back, and I could only watch it. I couldn't move. I couldn't think. I mean, how can you with something like that right in front of you? I don't know how long I stood there. The it didn't move. Just stared at me. I don't know how I broke free of the trance, but eventually I did regain my senses, and I did the only thing I could think of. I raised my pistol, fired, and ran out of there like Lilesh herself was behind me. I didn't expect to get far. Deep, you should know by now what I figured that thing was. I was expecting to get vaporised. But nothing happened. Maybe it was too big to fit through the caverns after me or something? I have no idea. I wasn't about to look back and check. I just kept running. All the way back through the tunnels. That was stupid, I know. I didn't have a torch and it was nearly pitch dark. I don't know how I didn't end up falling and hurting myself, or even just lost down there. Maybe I just remembered the way back better than I thought I did, but I didn't stop running or look back once until I was back out in the open air. Alexei was furious, of course. Said I had cheated him and that he'd report me and Red Steel to the Guild Authority. I barely listened. I've taken some time off from work for a little while, just so I can get my head on straight. I didn't tell Salatar what happened, but the boy paid in advance, so I doubt he'd care anyway. That's why I had to come here. I had to get this down. Tell someone. I know you won't believe me. I know how this all sounds. But I know what I saw. It was a dragon. A real-life dragon. And the maelstrom take you if you dare call me a liar. There was a dragon in that cavern, and we are all in danger. Sorry, I didn't mean to get so worked up. I've not been sleeping much lately. Final Notes I assumed at first that this was a prank cooked up by the librarians. A nice little hazing for me in my new position. But as it turned out, this was an actual donation that someone felt needed to be added to the collection. Dragons indeed. I don't think I need to waste time here by explaining why there's no corroborating evidence for Mr. Locken's claimed sighting. Things started making a bit more sense when I began going through the supplementals. It seems that before coming to us, Mr. Locken approached the geology department of Alalton University about the Yoskai Caves. He left a copy of what they gave him. I think he was more interested in the mapped areas of the network because he must have missed the part where it says that the caves lie over the top of a dormant volcano. 
I wonder if perhaps lingering poisonous fumes might not have contributed to Mr. Locken's dragon sighting. A hallucination would certainly make a lot more sense. Gilia was able to make contact with the Delane family. Theodore Delane, who heads the Delane Textile Company, was, according to her, lovely to chat with. But aside from confirming that his son Alexei did indeed hire a mercenary from the Red Steel Fighters Guild to assist in the recovery of a family heirloom, he could provide no additional information apart from that the family did not pursue legal action against Red Steel. Apparently, and I'm quoting here, the boy needed to learn not to waste his money. Alexei Delane was not available to comment. There is only one thing that really strikes me as strange. We reached out to Red Steel just to see if we could follow up with Mr. Locken. According to Lydia Sapran, the current guildmaster, Mr. Locken left the guild not long after coming to speak with us, claiming there was something else he had to do. A purpose was his exact wording. Mr. Locken has not been seen or heard from since. Inscription complete. The Pensive Tower is a podcast distributed by Scroll and Dagger and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. Today's episode was written and performed by Gareth Cadogan and produced by Gina Moriarty. Original theme by Evangelos Anastasatos with artwork by Cassie Shepard. For more information such as ways to support us or to view show notes, visit us at scrollanddagger.com and please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.